Well, good, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Scott from the Old Curiosity Shop. Well, actually, you only get a fraction of my face, but you know what I look like. You don't need to see me. I'm here on Father's Day to wish all of the fathers a happy Father's Day, of course. But I also am excited to show you something that I bought this morning at a flea market. Now, I had no intentions of going to the flea market this morning, but I woke up at 4 o'clock in the morning. I wake up at 4 o'clock in the, in the morning most days, and I ended up leaving the house at about 5 o'clock, got to the flea market at 6. It takes me about an hour to get to this particular flea market. And boy, am I glad I went, because I came home with this. Now, I'm going to spend the next several minutes telling you what this is, and I'm going to go into a lot of great detail. If it's not your thing, that's okay. Just click fast forward or move on to somebody else. But if you want some history on what is inside of this wooden box, I'm about to tell you. I'll also take the camera off of the stand and do some close-ups, but for right now, we're just going to look at it, and I'm going to tell you what it is. But before I begin on this hot and sultry, steamy Father's Day afternoon, I'm, uh, what am I doing? I'm sipping, um, this is iced tea, and I'm drinking it out of a 1930s Anchor Hocking Manhattan tumbler. Yes, I just found a whole bunch of these, ooh, last week. I'll talk more about those in, in another video. But let's have a sip, and then we'll find out what's inside of this box. Mmm. Okay. Now, as you're looking at it, some of you are saying, well, there might be a microscope in it, or maybe a film projector, maybe a portable typewriter, maybe even a suitcase model phonograph, yeah? You know, with the crank on the side. Well, you're all wrong. <laughs> but... If you know the kind of thing that I like to uh, collect, you'll have a pretty good idea of what this might be. Now, it's a wooden box, and it is covered in mahogany. I'm sorry, this is a walnut veneer. This is, I've done absolutely nothing to it. Haven't even cleaned it, nothing. Except take, you know, a pretty good look at it. But we'll spin it all the way around. And we can see there's a trap door back here, which I'm not going to open yet. Some little escutcheons, which look like keyholes at the top and the bottom. We do see a leather handle on the top, which gives us the impression we can carry this. It's not very fancy looking. Maybe it's military. Don't worry, I'm not scratching my granite countertop. Okay, enough, enough, enough. What is it? Well, I'm going to push the little button over here. There's a, there's, you can't see it, but way back, way, well, I'll let you see it right here. Okay, we're going to push this. That releases it. And are you ready for this? Drum roll, please. Oh my goodness. Now I have to tell you, let's get her out of the way. We're going to talk about her some other time too, but not today. When I got to the flea market at 6 o'clock this morning and I saw this, it was like that on the table. The man had just set it out. I got detached retina when I saw this. I knew exactly what it was. I didn't even have to open it. But I prepared myself. This is rare. You hardly ever find them in the wild. And you have to prepare yourself that the box has been gutted. A few years after this was made, it was obsolete. It would still operate. The, the technology, radio technology had advanced beyond this after 1925, just exponentially as you got into the early 30s. So normally, these are gutted. People just save the box, you know. 
and Uncle Henry throws his old tools in it, puts his old screwdrivers in it out in the garage or something. But this one I found was very excited when I saw the front of the machine, of the radio. It is a radio, it's a portable radio. This is a 1925 uh, RCA, now I did not say RCA Victor, because RCA and Victor hadn't merged yet. But it's an RCA Radiola 26 Super Heterodyne Circuitry, which was a uh, uh, improvement over the earlier uh, TRF tuned radio frequency, which was popular just a few years prior. This radio, when it was new in 1925, cost about $220 or so. Now, I'm going to let you go and figure out how, how expensive this machine was in 1925 uh, at a cost of 200 and, about $225. Remember, some people were still making a dollar a day salary. So it was not cheap, and it was sold as a portable radio. And we're going to get a close-up here and actually see... Uh, that it does say portable uh, is printed right here. And I'll show you that in a minute. But, um, by the way, portable uh, with the batteries inside, it weighs about 30 pounds. So, you can figure out, you know, a five pound bag of sugar, right? This weighs 30 pounds. Portable, yeah, right. But, they had little flappers and their uh, boyfriends on the beach and camping and other places with this radio it was designed to be lugged around it's an early RCA it's a it's one of the first portables it's a rare radio um, they're not scarce but they are hard to find and the condition that this one in is absolutely unbelievable and I'm gonna tell you why so we're gonna go over it completely let me take the camera off the tripod now, and we're going to just come in closer and talk about how the radio works, why it's so special, and why I was so excited to find it in this particular uh, condition. And also, what's going on here? What is this thing? Why are we spinning around here? Uh, what's up with that? Well, I'm going to tell you as well. So, let's come back and we'll talk more about this wonderful old radio. Now I'm going to start with what is so exciting and rare uh, to find on a radio like, like this. We're going to start with the handle. Would you believe that reproduction leather handles sell on eBay for $150 just for a reproduction leather handle? This one has some dry rotting issues right here, obviously. But you never really want to pick these radios up by these old handles anyway. In fact, I'm just going to leave that like that. That's an original handle, and I may be able to take this to a, a leather crafting type person. I do know of one, and uh, I think he's going to be able to repair this for me, and I'll have a repaired original uh, handle. But $150 just for a replacement, and they do sell for that on eBay. We'll pop this back open and we'll talk about some other elements of the radio that make it quite uh, fantastic. What radio collectors call um, attic fresh. That's the way you want to find these. This was put away many, many years ago and no one has monkeyed with it. Okay, no annoying child in the 1950s took this to elementary school for a show and tell and butchered it. Which is just what makes it so unbelievable. First of all, here on the dials that we have, you'll see these four uh, little um, either celluloid, probably celluloid inserts. I'll move in close on them and get it to focus. Um, and so they have kind of a, not it's not mother of pearl, but it's sort of a smoky mar marble looking effect. But it's just, um, it's just a celluloid. These are just glued on. You find these radios, one is missing, two are missing, three are missing. You find all four, 
Very hard to find all four. We also have the uh, plate up here, which covers the uh, housing for the for the tubes. And we can clearly see RCA Radiola 26, portable, super heterodyne, that's the circuitry, uh, Radio Corporation of America. This has an internal horn speaker, a folded horn. We're going to look at it. That's the original grill cloth with no holes in it. Folks, this radio is going to be 100 years old in 2025. This is amazing. It just doesn't happen that you find these in this condition. One little nip out of the veneer here. This is walnut veneer. And I'm going to be able to patch that. We have the station selector here. Look at how beautiful the indicators are. All right, now I'm turning this and uh, we're gonna see on the inside what's happening when I do that. We have two uh, station selectors and you've got to tune each one to, to the same frequency. So it's a little tricky, but not as tricky, but an improvement on the circuitry of just a year or two earlier. The, here we have the uh, battery on off. Uh, this is a battery set. We didn't have electric sets yet. Uh, in 1925. That wouldn't happen until a few years later. And then this is the volume control over here. These are these are re uh, rheostats. We're going to look at those in a minute. Rheostats. All right, so all the escutcheons are here. No one has polished them. They have, they have tarnished a little bit, but we have nice old patina. That's an exciting thing which is just unbelievable. And then here on the front, we have this strange octagonal panel made of, of walnut that sort of spins. And you may be wondering, well, what on earth is that? Well, this is the antenna, the antenna. We have a loop antenna inside of this walnut panel and it actually completes the circuit. If you take this wall, if you take this panel out, you're going to get nothing from the radio because not only is it the antenna, but it also uh, get, will give you complete continuity, completes the circuit, and enables the radio to actually function as it should. So this is often missing as well because it comes right out of there. I'm going to show you that. We're going to pull the speaker grill off and take a look at the amazing horn speaker on the inside, which is just unbelievable. But I was still holding my breath when I found this radio <laughs> because I knew what I was hoping to find behind this panel. And we're just going to loosen this one side here. I think I could take this off. This was a hold your breath moment. <gasps> oh my goodness, you have no idea, ladies and gentlemen. Six original tubes. Do you know how hard it is to find these tubes? And we've got all six of them. These are the old Radiotrons. And uh, we can see, uh, let's see, what can we see? We can, we can see RCA here. So these two are RCA tubes. Now this radio was used because originally it would have come with all RCA tubes and then at some point, uh, we have a Cunningham tube over here, a Philco tube, and, and one Silvertone tube. So we have the different tubes. But these tubes are early. They're almost impossible to find. Uh, I, I couldn't believe it. Now, let's get down inside just a little bit. And we can see here... We have the two variable capacitors for the uh, for the tuning, and they are you know nothing is bent. They're turning just as they should. There's one, and here's the second one here. These are the capa variable capacitors here, and then the two uh, we have two rheostats here. One is for the battery. And the other one, of course, uh, for the volume control, which we can see here. 
and this is all original circuitry. <laughs> this is this was state of the art 1925. I'm gonna put this back in. I think I can get it in there with with uh, the one hand that I'm using. Let's see. No, yes. Wait a minute. Okay, we're in there. All right, that's in. Uh, now I have to put the cell. I have to put the camera down, and we're going to take a look at the speaker. Okay, it's really difficult to do with one hand, so I already pushed the spring-loaded pins here to release the, the grill, which covers covers the speaker, and we'll just put, well, we'll just let it fall off like that. Unbelievable to have that original grill cloth on there. You're going to hear me say unbelievable many times in this video. It's going to get on your nerves, but you're going to have to trust me when I say unbelievable. If we have any major radio collectors out there, you understand what I'm talking about. Now look at this horn. This is another reason why I was really excited. Let's brighten it up a little bit here. Give me a second to get it. Now, this is the speaker. Uh, this is either uh, this is either sheet brass or uh, or um, or sheet uh, uh, tin here painted black, and this is called um, a folded horn. So exponentially, let's see, the skinny part of the horn here connects to what's really just. Uh, basically what they were using for headphones in those days, magnetic headphones, which is really nothing more than a telephone receiver, right? A, a large one. These are little shock absorbers, which actually cause the horn to just sort of float inside of the, uh, inside of the cabinet. There's uh, one, two, and there's a third back here, which you can't see. And uh, they're, it's actually crumbling. If you could see this little pink, pinkish orange stuff there, that's crumbling foam shock absorbers, which have no elasticity yet. And I'm going to have to fabricate something to replace those. Otherwise, you get rattle and you'll get distortion in the sound. So the skinny part of the metal horn connects here to the magnetic. Uh, transmitter or headphone which is what is inside of this housing here now I have not put a meter on this I don't know if we've got mag if we've got a good working driver here on the speaker or not we should and then as we move along we, we increase exponentially this horn wraps around to the back which you can't see until I get the horn out of there and then it widens here and the volume the sound actually comes out uh, so this is all really acoustic amplification. But if that horn were to have been ripped out of there, it would be very difficult <laughs> to replace it. All right, that's what we get on the front of the machine. Let's turn it around and take a look at what we get in the back. Again, I've done no cabinet work on this at all. I've only had it now for a couple of hours, but really excited about it and want to show you. We'll pull the back down here. And this is the area where the tubes would be. Uh, I'm sorry, where the, uh, where the batteries would be. You'd have three uh, tubular cell batteries here and another four over here. So this would be jam-packed with batteries. These are all the connectors. Everything is labeled uh, so you know where to connect. You've got your A+, plus, your B, your C, you have a ground. This piece has come off, but this is what keeps the batteries in snug. I just have to reinstall this. That's just come off of that. That's no problem to put, to put that back. Now, what's wonderful about this set <laughs> is this, little, this plug right here. When, um, when, you're, when you're using this as a portable radio, these are all the battery connectors right here. 
So you're going to plug that in here and this will engage all of the batteries so all the juice from the batteries is now operating the radio. If you want to use the radio at your house, you could this, you also got with the set a huge battery box which was a nice walnut box that this radio sat on top of. You would unplug the portable battery connection. I don't know if you can see there's a cutout down in here. Let's get it. Uh, you can't see that. If I can't see it, you can't see it. But it's there. There's a cutout down on the bottom of the case. And you just feed this through the bottom and then into the battery box below. And you can use this at home. They were stronger batteries, batteries bigger batteries. And uh, you could use the radio in your house without draining the power from the portable batteries, which you had to buy separately to run these radios. Every one of these I've ever seen almost always has um, lost to this particular decal here. And this is really just explaining to you how to disconnect the portable battery connection and connect it to the home for, for home use. And then this is the licensing information here by RCA, RCA Radiola 26. And we can see they're going to list all their patents from 1912 uh, up to 1924. That's the last patent that we've got there. See that? It might be blurry. 1924. And again, this set was made in 1925. These weren't made for very long because, again, there was vast improvement. It's sort of like the early days of the computer, of computer technology. Uh, but this is this is this is built to, built to last. It's a solid box. It's very well made. And the oh, I forgot to show you. In these early days, uh, RCA didn't make anything. In fact, RCA didn't make any of this. They owned the the uh, the patents on, on on a lot of the circuitry. The superheterodyne that belonged to RCA. And if you wanted to make a superheterodyne set, you had to buy the license from RCA or just get around it in some way. But RCA didn't make any any of this. The electronic components are either ooh, Westinghouse or General Electric and I can't remember I'd have to go look that up. But it, the, the, but the electronics are not made by the RCA company. They're just marketing at this point, at this early age. Even the cabinets Look at the inside. We have a we have a label in here, which I hope you can see says Stout Smith Trust. Uh, fine. Wait a minute. What does it say? It says high grade cabinets, Salem, Indiana. It may be blurry for you, but I'm able to read it. So even the ca the cabinets are made. Even the cabinets are made. Uh, by another company. Electronics made by one company, cabinets made by another. It's all put together and marketed and sold by the Radio Corporation of America, which would buy the Victor Company in 1929, I want to say, and become RCA Victor. But at this point, it's still just David Sarnoff on his own. He has not spoken to Eldridge Johnson yet to get the Victor Company. It's just Sarnoff with RCA. And uh, now, all right, we're not going to put this. Well, let's go ahead and get this back on and I'll talk a little bit more. Everybody asks the question, does it work? Does it work? Does it work? Old radios never work. Let's just say that. Okay. Now, everything in terms of electronics of this age needs to be restored. And this is a battery set. They don't make the batteries. You either have to make a battery eliminator or rig something up, which you can do. Um, but we have to put a meter on this. 
old capacitors always have to be changed. And one of the funny little things, and then this video is almost over, and I appreciate you letting me rattle on. A lot of you are not interested in this at all. I'm fascinated with it, and I'm so glad I was able to find it today. But something interesting I want to tell you is back here behind, this is the chassis, which we can't see, underneath the tubes, there is a metal box. Oh about the size half the size of a lunch box and the working guts the working brains of the radio are down inside of that box there are some coils there are a few capacitors uh, some transistors some transistors ha huh. so, not hardly some transformers different th different components electronic components are down inside of this box and because it was a trade secret okay there was a lot of competition going on at the time um, Edward Armstrong and Lee DeForest and on and on and on but what they did RCA did was they put their their uh, circuitry inside of this box and they filled it with liquid pine rosin <laughs> and let it harden. Yes, now pine rosin, you know, the same kind of rosin that you on the violin bow. Um, th this metal box back here underneath these tubes is filled with that liquid rosin. It's hardened in there. You can't see any of the circuitry. <laughs> you can't chisel the stuff out. What happens over time is that rosin has a tendency to shrink and it can pull wires away, it can sort of choke capacitors. And um, if you don't have continuity, if any of those coils, if anything in that box, which is called the catacomb, by the way, and that's what they called it. If anything in the catacomb needs to be redone, it is a horrible, horrible job. I did it once years ago. I'm never going to do it again. You pull this out from the chassis, and you've got to stick the metal box in an oven at about 300, well, 300 is too much, at about, two, at about 250 degrees, and you've got to melt that pine uh, uh, rosin <laughs> and dump it out. And uh, I don't suggest using your mother's oven uh, or your wife's oven or your husband's oven or anybody's indoor oven. I suggest you get an old beat up toaster oven and do it. But it is a gloopy, gloppy, sticky, smelly mess. If you can imagine the consistency of, imagine taking a bottle of pine saw and having it be the consistency of honey and then it smells, and then, and then burnt wire. It's, it's, I mean, I have to say, I, I lo loved doing it. I don't know that I would do it again because it is such a mess. But there's a lot involved in getting these sets working again. Uh, I'm going to have to have to make decisions about that. Whether I go through all of that nonsense, I shouldn't call it nonsense or not, I don't know. I, I may just be cleaning this up. Uh, I may pass it on to another collector at some point, or I may just be putting it in my own collection as a display piece, because you simply just <laughs> don't find them in this condition. Um, yeah, there's a lot more I could tell you about. You can actually take the antenna panel off and mount it on the back of the radio. So if you're using the radio at home, you can close the door and have the antenna uh, attached to the back of the radio and then you can close so you don't have to have it you know with the door swung open to to, uh, to listen to it and if I go to the to the trouble of actually having the full thing restored it would be a gem in any early radio collectors collection by the way those two holes right there are for connecting a headphone if you want to listen to it uh, at 2 o'clock in the morning to catch the uh, Vincent Lopez Orchestra on the roof of the Taft Hotel in New York City. 
Well, that's it. Really excited to have found this rare radio today. And I appreciate you listening to me rattle on and on and on. I'll be back again all throughout the week with other things, a little more typical of what you'll see in the old curiosity shop. I have decided I'm going to do some restoration on this wonderful figure old, figure old lamp here. I've got another old clock there to work on. And I'm going to show you the this pair of lamps. I've got some cranberry glass. Got a lot of stuff going on in the old curiosity shop this week. That's it. Okay. Happy Father's Day, everyone. I'm Scott. So long for now.